Good afternoon and welcome. Thank you for attending today's hearing. Uh, I, my name is Kathleen Borain. I serve as the Maryland Insurance Commissioner, and this is the Maryland Insurance Administration's second regular public hearing on specific carrier rate increases for long-term care insurance for 2022. Today's hearing will focus on two rate increase requests that are before the administration. In the individual long-term care market, these requests are from Allianz Life Insurance Company of North America, which is proposing increases of between 20 and 55%, depending upon the benefit period, and from Berkshire Life Insurance Company of America, which is, in, which is proposing increases of 5%. These requests affect a total of approximately 337 Maryland policyholders. And the purpose of our hearing today is for the insurance company officials to explain the reasons for the rate increases, to explain the new benefit options, and for the administration to consider whether the proposed rate increases are in compliance with Maryland's laws and regulations relating to long-term care insurance. So you will hear some questions being asked of the companies uh, in order to obtain the information which we need both what we get here in this public session and in the very thorough process that our actuaries go through in interacting with the companies and seeking information and securing documentation that then allows them to make an assessment of whether the rate increases are appropriate and consistent with Maryland law. Um, today in particular, it's important that at these hearings we hear from any consumers uh, regarding their concerns uh, about specific rate increases. So let me just take a moment as we get started to introduce the people who are here with me from the Maryland Insurance Administration. So our panel members include Brad Boban, who is our Chief Actuary, David Cooney, the Associate Commissioner for Life and Health. Hello, good afternoon. Thank you. Adam Zimmerman, Senior Actuary. Hello, everybody. And Jeff G, Senior Actuary. Hello. So just a few procedures today. Um, first of all, remember that we are being recorded and uh, it would be helpful if people keep themselves muted uh, while uh, others are talking, unless it's your turn to, um, to uh, present so that we can keep the recording uh, clean and everybody can hear. Uh, when it comes time for public comment, we will first call on any members of the public who are registered to speak in advance. Today, that's no one. Um, no one has signed up to speak in advance. So at the end of the period of time when the companies present and the MIA has asked its questions, we will open up the opportunity for individuals who are here to ask any questions that they might have, or actually that's not true, not to ask questions, but to make any comments that they wish to make. The, the Q&A piece is really for our actuaries and our team to ask questions of the company. Um, the comments from interested parties that uh, are, are invited. So you, even though uh, the hearing is today, you are invited to make comments and to submit those comments through Tuesday, August 23rd. So if as a result of what you hear today, you have comments that you wish to make, we're happy to hear from you. Uh, you can upload those comments to our website and we can identify the link where that will go. There's a long-term care page that can be found at the MIA website by clicking on the consumers tab at the top of our own home page and then clicking on long-term care link. That will enable you to submit any of your comments. Um, I think that really takes care of our, our um, housekeeping, if you will, for today. Uh, at the end of the, of the um, hearing, I'll remind people of uh, what that's what the what the time frames are and, and how to make sure that you're heard. So I'm going to turn this over to our actuarial department uh, and folks that have a few comments that they'd like to make about the MIA process as we get started. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, hi, my, my name is Brad Bobin. Um, I'm the chief actuary at the MIA. Um, First, I, I just want to give some high-level background about these long-term care policies in general. Um, you know, these long-term care policies are all guaranteed renewable policies. 
which means that the insurance company cannot cancel or refuse to renew any policyholder, but it does not mean that rates cannot be changed. Um, that, that being said, when these policies were originally priced when they were first on sale back in the 80s and 90s, the intent of the insurance companies was to make these a level premium product. Um, and in general, under even most ideal scenarios, these long-term care policies are extremely long-term products which require 50 to 60 year projections. And the intent under the ideal scenario was to collect a, a level premium. And in early years, premiums would far exceed claims and carriers would reserve those premiums, earn interest on those premiums and have enough premium banked for later years when claims start greatly exceeding premium. Um, and you know that is under the ideal circumstances. Um, when these policies were sold, the, the actuaries made their best estimates using what data was available um, from, from other industries, from the life insurance industry, from annuities. But as actual long-term care experience has materialized over the decades, a, a, a lot of the assumptions have proven to be pr pretty far off the mark compared to actuals. Um, carriers have missed on the average annual lapse rate, the, the percent of people that are going to lapse before they can make a claim, they, they've missed on interest rate assumptions, they, they've missed on morbidity, the, the average claims per thousand claimants, they, they've missed on the average duration of the claim, claims are lasting longer than expected, um, the, the assumptions have missed on, on the average daily cost of a claim. Um, so each of these separate assumptions individually means that the, the premiums that were initially set are, are not enough to cover claims. And, and in aggregate, all of these combined means that in some policies, premiums have been significantly below what, what are needed to cover claims. And so th this is an industry-wide phenomenon. It's not specific to either of the carriers here, um, but, but this, this is the overall reason why that, that, that even though the, the policies were intended to be a level premium, that the premium increase are being requested and, and guaranteed renewable policies are allowed renewal increases. They just cannot target any individual policyholder that the increases must be given flat across the whole class of policyholders, whether that's all policyholders within a given policy form or all policyholders with an inflation rider or all policyholders with an unlimited lifetime benefit, you know, the, the, the rates can change on a rating class basis. Um, as far as the filings that are under our review today for today's hearing, there are two filings. Um, Allianz has submitted an average requested rate increase of 33%. Um, that average actually comprises of, of two distinct increases, a, a rate increase of 20% for policyholders with a three-year benefit period and a requested rate increase of 55% for policyholders with a five-year benefit period. Um, these increases affect only 13 Maryland policyholders, uh, seven policyholders with the three-year benefit period, six with the five-year benefit period. Um, even though this is a small number of policyholders, I, I just want to assure you that we at the MIA do a full review of every single filing. You know, even if there was only a single policyholder, we would not alter the way we review rates. Um, and, and in general, you know, while there are credibility issues with a block of policies that small, carriers in general are submitting both national and state specific data in their rate filings to help support their rate increases. And, you know, for, for blocks of business as small as this, you know, the, 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 the national experience, you know, adjusted to the premium level of Maryland is, is what we focus on during the rate review. Um, Berkshire Life has submitted a request for a 5% increase for two separate policy forms, um, one impacting 146 policyholders, the other impacting 47 policyholders. That request does not vary. It, it is a 5% flat increase across all policyholders in either of these policy forms. Um, and with that, I will turn it back over to the commissioner. unmute there. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Broban. Let me just take a second here to uh, start with, um, I have to apologize. My 
I'm, I'm having a few technical um, difficulties at the moment. So just give me a second here to get to the right screen. I'm, one of my screens has collapsed. So, so Brad, do you just want to call on one of the, we're just going to call on the two companies. Um, so let's start with yeah, I, um, I, I think up first is um, Allianz, um, Mr. Laska, I believe, if, if you could please give your testimony. Are, are you able to speak yet, Mr. Laska? I believe. You want to? Can you unmute? Hi, can you hear me now? Yes, 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 we can yes. hear you. All right, like the old, well, new spring commercial, old driving commercial. I appreciate everyone's patience. Um, yeah, with my technical difficulties, so I can go ahead uh, with my prepared remarks. Hello, my name is. Scott Laska, and I'm a long-term care actuary at Allianz Life Insurance Company of North America, and I'm in good standing with the Society of Actuaries and the American Academy of Actuaries. I'm joined on this call by David Kuma, counsel to Allianz Life. Thank you to Commissioner Brain and the rest of the MIA for reviewing our filing and having this hearing today to give us the opportunity to discuss the considerations that went into our request. We know there's a challenging balance to reach with rate increases. We understand they are difficult for our policyholders, along with insurance departments who are trying to balance the impact on their constituents with maintaining a private market for long-term care needs. We are requesting a rate increase on our term LTC product under policy form numbers 8PQMD and 8PFQMD. This policy form was sold in Maryland from 2003 to 2006. This rate increase would impact around 13 of our 1,559 Maryland policyholders. We are currently requesting a, an average rate increase of 33%. The level of the rate increase varies by the policy benefit period. The MIA approved a 15% increase on this policy form in 2009. We filed a rate increase on this policy form in 2020 as part of a nationwide rate increase request. That filing was ultimately disapproved by the MIA. Our current filing is the same as the 2020 request. We are filing for rate increases because some of the pricing assumptions for our guaranteed renewable LTC products, although they were based on the best information available at the time, have not been consistent with emerging experience. Policyholders are going on claim more frequently and staying on claim longer than we assumed when we priced these products. People are also keeping their insurance longer than we expected, resulting in more policyholders reaching an age where they need care and go on claim. The emerging experience is worse for policies with a longer benefit period, which is why the rate increase request is larger for a longer benefit period. We understand that this request is greater than the required annual cap, 15% in Maryland. We would like the opportunity to work with the MIA to phase in the rate increase over multiple years and no more than 15% per year, so we can be more transparent with our policyholders regarding our increased plan. Based on our experience, we could justify higher rate increases on this policy form than what we are requesting. The major consideration in determining our rate request is the impact on policyholders. On the one hand, we are balancing the financial losses of this policy form, which has loss ratios above 100%, meaning we expect to pay out more in claims than we will receive as premiums over the life of the policy form. On the other hand, we realize rate increases are difficult for our policyholders, which is why we have requested far less than we could justify. We believe rate increases are necessary to ensure policyholders will have their much needed long-term care benefits in the future, since it is our highest priority to fulfill our commitments to our policyholders. By lowering the requested increase from what is justified, we anticipate sharing in the losses of this business. The full requested rate increase is approved and implemented. The company does not currently intend to request any additional rate increases on this policy form unless experience worsens, and we will guarantee not to increase the revised rates for four years. The requested premium revision is granted. The total rate increases approved in Maryland would still be lower than the total rate increases approved on this product nationwide. The premium levels after the requested increase on this policy form would also be lower than the premiums of long-term care policies sold in the market today. It is important we offer and communicate to policyholders multiple options to reduce the impact of the rate increase if they are unable or unwilling to pay the higher premium. 
Among their options, policyholders can reduce their benefit period or benefit amount, cancel their benefit increase rider, or lengthen their elimination period. We communicate these options in several places in our rate increase mailings and encourage policyholders to call our dedicated contact center to better understand their options. The contact center has access to various resources to illustrate policyholder premiums and benefits under different coverage scenarios, along with access to a cost of care website. The cost of care website provides average LTC costs across the country so policyholders can make more informed decisions about how much coverage they'll need. I encourage any affected policyholders to access the cost of care website and to call our dedicated contact center for any assistance with understanding the options that are available. We are offering additional benefits to our policyholders as part of this increase as well. Those who choose to reduce or cancel their benefit increase riders will maintain all of their past accrued benefits to date. Additionally, we are offering a free paid up benefit for policyholders who decide to stop paying premium because of the rate increase. Rather than losing their entire coverage, policyholders who stop paying premium as part of the rate increase will get a reduced paid up benefit, typically equal to the premiums that have been paid into the policy. As we considered the impact our requested increase would have on our policyholders, we wanted to know that policyholders would still find value in their insurance after the requested increase. In addition to premiums being lower than long-term care policies sold in the market today, we looked at policyholder behavior around our recent rate increase implementation. In our experience, the vast majority of policyholders impacted by a rate increase have decided to maintain their current benefits and pay the increased premium. This is in line with experience across the industry. Nationwide, we have seen around 12% of policyholders elect to reduce benefits on recent rate increases to most single digits decide to stop paying premium altogether. It indicates to us that policyholders still see value in their Allianz long-term care insurance to cover future long-term care needs that can be very costly and deplete retirement savings quickly. Once again, I'd like to thank you, Commissioner Borain and the rest of the MIA for giving us the opportunity to discuss the considerations that went into our rate increase request. We look forward to working with the MIA on finding a solution that balances the needs of all stakeholders and appreciate your consideration of our filing. Happy to take any questions to at this point. Thank you, Mr. Laska. Um, Brad, do you or any members of your team have questions? Yeah, thank, thank you, Mr. Alaska. Um, one question I have for you. So you're you're filing for for these 13 policyholders out of 1,559 total in Maryland. Um, is it accurate to say you're not filing for the other 1,546 because back in 2020 the MIA approved the rate increases for those other blocks of policies, and, and you are just now seeking the, the 2020 increase for this block that that was not a, approved. Yep. Yeah, I think we've had various. I was here last year discussing probably about half of our rest of our business in Maryland. Um, so yeah, we've had kind of filings at different points of approval. Um, and this one, we're just coming back because it got just approved in 2020. And, and so the, the, this filing reflects the same assumptions that were filed back in 2020. No recent updates have, have been made to the assumptions. To, to, with, with respect to the impact of COVID or, or anything more, more recent, it, it's the same set of assumptions? We did do a uh, review of our experience right after we had filed this in 2020, kind of the end of 2020, um, before we had incorporated COVID and we did make some updates to our assumptions, but they didn't change any of the increases that would be justified. Um, and we, we have been this year doing a more robust review of our experience in light of COVID um, and haven't seen, I guess while we did see claim terminations peak up a little bit earlier on, we've seen a lot of the assumptions kind of go back or experience come back to the levels like pre-COVID. All right, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Jeff, did you have any additional questions? Uh, yes. Uh... So, Mr. Laska, so your uh, first rate increase was in uh, 2009, and then the second request was in 2020. Can you let us know why you wait another 11 years to seek another yeah. rate increase? Yeah, um, I think there are a couple components. One is uh, before, or I should say the 2020 requests that we did were larger than one, the ones that we had done in 2009. And um, 
we wanted to make sure that there was enough experience to support going in with larger requests where there was any delay in filing on top of that we absorbed those losses and we're not requesting any increases to try to make up for that like what we're using now to justify the increases it's just based on our future expectations too so we're, we're not trying to make up for the delay in filing okay and i uh i see your uh if the revised rate uh if we approve your requested rates you said you are not going to make another request for four years uh, I'm, I'm wondering, is that possible you can uh, convert these 13 people to non cancelable policies, which means you are not seeking any rate increases for 13 policy, policies in the future? Something I could take back for sure. I, I can't say we haven't done that in any other states up to this point. Um, I think we, we do, it's what we have communicated in our filing. We, we don't intend any future rate filings, assuming that this is approved. And um, I guess I know the four-year rate guarantee only lasts so long, but uh, that right now our plan wouldn't be to do future filings, but I can certainly take back your questions about the non cancelable bill. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Lask, I have one more question. Just so I understand the reduced benefit options that, that you're going to be providing these policyholders. So you said one one reduced benefit option is going to be a, a paid up policy equal equal to the the value of premiums paid in, correct? Yep. And without any account to any claims paid to date. I believe so. I, I don't want to misspeak. Um, I think it does account for claims that have been paid, but I can for sure double check and get back to you like I'm certain on that. All right, and then the other reduced benefit option would be for, for, for those policyholders with, with an inflation rider, if they remove that rider, they keep the accumulated value of whatever inflation has taken place in the past, they just stop in incurring future inflation increases, is, is that accurate? Yep, that's right, and further, I think people might have an option even if like they had a 5% compound benefit and they reduced to a simple benefit, they would maintain all the 5% compound increases to date and then just have simple increases going off of that. So um, that'd be in the event of a reduction, but what you said for a termination is exactly right. Okay, great. Thanks for that clarification. Yep. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Laska. I don't have any questions, but what I will comment on is that uh, when the time comes where uh, the MIA has uh, completed its review and analysis, and if there uh, is a rate increase that is permitted, and um, to the extent that there are uh, buy-down options that will mitigate or eliminate those increases for individuals, what I am deeply concerned about is the clarity of those communications. And so we will want to work with you on your letter to consumers to make it clear. I think for many consumers, uh, the most frustrating element of getting that notice of a rate increase is understanding what their options are. Um, so we want to work with carriers very closely to improve the communications um, and make sure that consumers very clearly understand what applies to them and what does not, i.e. on claims versus off claim, and that they understand what those options are um, and how to interact with the company to get more detail and perhaps additional options. So um, let's make sure that we work closely together to produce something that an average person can understand easily. Yeah, I agree. I definitely appreciate in advance your help with that and yeah. cooperation with that. So. Absolutely, thank you. So I think that that takes us now to our next carrier, which is Berkshire. So who do we have here from um, Berkshire Life Insurance Company of America? Who are me? Hi, Mr. Wang. So um, welcome and uh, happy to hear from you in terms of the 5% <clears throat> rate increase that you are looking at. All right. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Dixon Wang. I'm a member of the American Academy of Actuaries and an associate of the Society of Actuaries. 
I'm a consulting actually representing Berkshire Life Insurance Company of America. Uh, thank you for having me today. And I'll give an overview of the current long-term care rate increase filing in Maryland. Uh, first of all, there are two policy forms involved in this filing. Uh, policy form BG01P06-04, also known as care provider, uh, was issued in Maryland from 2004 to 2009. Uh, there are 147 Maryland policies and uh, 232 insureds affected at the time of filing. Policy, um, the other policy form, uh, BG01P01-09, also known as LTC Choice Provider, was issued in Maryland from 2009 to 2012. Uh, there are 59 Maryland policies and 92 insureds affected at the time of filing. Uh, both policy forms are no longer being marketed or sold in any jurisdiction. As you may have read in news reports, um, uh, many factors have changed over the years that have impacted the pricing of long-term care insurance products. For example, the cost of long-term care services continues to rise, people are living longer, and the need for long-term care is growing rapidly. Due to these changes, insurance companies expect to pay higher amounts of benefits than originally anticipated. This increase in expected benefits is the major reason why insurance companies have to increase premium rates on enforced long-term care policies. In order to lessen the impact of this rate increase on policyholders, Berkshire Life has sought approval for the smallest increase necessary, but is filing the company is requesting the approval of a flat increase of 5% for both policy forms. The company will continue to monitor experience on policies and will take great actions again, only if experience proves it to be necessary. Uh, both of uh, Berkshire Life's long-term care products, care provider and LTC choice provider are guaranteed renewable, uh, which means the company cannot cancel a policy or refuse to renew a policy as long as policyholders continue to pay the premiums due. However, the company may adjust future premiums on a class basis, subject to a state-by-state -state regulatory process. The company offers various options for our policyholders to mitigate the impact of the rate increase. They may reduce the daily benefit amount in multiples of $10, subject to a minimum of $50. They may reduce the benefit period, for example, from lifetime to five years, or from five years to three years. They may lengthen the reanimation period from zero day to 30 days, or from 30 days to 90 days. They may also reduce or remove the inflation protection rider, for example, from 5% compound to 3% compound. Uh, note that policyholders will not lose their benefit amount they've accumulated so far. Uh, if a policyholder has a 5% compound inflation rider and chooses to reduce it to a 3% compound, the daily benefit amount will increase at 3% going forward based on the current daily benefit amount. Or if they choose to drop the rider, uh, the daily benefit amount will become frozen at a current level and they will not lose the benefit they've accumulated so far. Uh, in, if a policy chooses not to continue paying any future premiums because of the rate increase. Uh, the company offers a non-payment option, uh, also known as the reduced paid up option. Uh, under this option, uh, instead of losing coverage, policyholders will retain some coverage under the current terms. However, benefits payable will be limited to an amount equal to the premiums paid into the policy and any claim benefits already paid before the date of lapse would be deducted from this amount. Um, all of these options are explained in the policyholders' let, uh, letters we sent um, to our policyholders. Um, there will also be a coverage change request form that we ask our policyholders to complete um, and send it to us before the deadline stated on the letter. And it is important that policyholders make any policy changes after careful consideration of their personal needs and circumstances as they will not be able to increase coverage in the future. So if policyholders wish to discuss other options 
they may contact their agent or call our office at 888-505-8743. This number is also uh, stated on the policyholder letter. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your consideration. I look forward to working with um, MIA in the future. Any questions for Mr. Wang? Yes, um, thank you, Mr. Wang. Um, my, my main question is about how this increase interacts with, with previously approved increases. Um, my records are saying that our most recently approved rate filing for, for these policies was, was approved on November 18th, 2020. And at the time, what was approved was a, a three-year rate increase for e each set of policies. The, the forms ending in 06, 04 were approved for three consecutive 5% rate increases for a cumulative 15.8. And the policy forms ending in 01, 09 were approved for three consecutive 7.5% increases for, for a cumulative of 24.2%. Um, and, and so, you know, it, that was not approved till November of 2020. And, and with rate increase notification requirements, you, you could not have started implementing these increases till the beginning of 2021. And, and it seems like we're still in that three year period and that those previously approved five and 7.5% increases are, are still in the process of being implemented. So are, are you asking for 5% in the future after the, the, those previous ones have, have gone through or, or or bumping up this year's increase 5% beyond what we previously approved. Could you clarify how, how this is intended to interact with that most recent rate filing? Well, the current 5% increase will be implemented after the, um, the previous uh, rate increase. So it will take place after the final 5%. Um, they will not be stacked up with each other. All right, thank you. So, Brad, have you done your questions? Yeah, Jeff, you can go ahead. Oh, okay. So, Mr. Wan, uh, my question is, uh, so you, this time, uh, you ask 5%, looks like you haven't seen big uh, experience changes from 2020's filing. So my question is, uh, um, what, what's your plan in the near near uh, future, like five years, your, uh, your plan? Are you going to uh, lock the rate changes for the future five years, like such as uh, what ADNs just, just stated, they, they're willing to lock the rate for four years. Are you going to consider that kind of option too? for our post Maryland policyholders? Uh, optimally, uh, for um, an eight, a rate increase of 5%, we uh, ideally, there will not be any uh, rate guarantee period or a lock period, uh, but we will continue to monitor the experience to file only if the experience uh, necessitates a future rate reaction. Okay. And then uh, between this fighting and the 2020s fighting, any assumptions, changes too? Uh, there are slight changes, but um, they are not major changes, but um, yes. Okay. Have you made any adjustments to assumptions related to COVID or is your company still evaluating and, and analyzing the longer term impact of that? Uh, we're still evaluating the uh, long-term impact. Uh, we consider it as a short-term impact uh, with a dip in payments and claims in uh, during the pandemic. And we do observe the claims are coming back. Uh, they are picking up um, in a pretty fast pace. Uh, but we will uh, evaluate the long-term impact uh, with a more extensive study. So is this 5% rate increase very unique just for Maryland? Um, do you look for seek the similar level of the rate increase in other states too? Um, this five percent, along with uh, like previous increases, uh, bind together uh, quite in line with other states. So um, they're quite in line with other states, right? 
Okay. Thank you. That's all the questions I had. Th thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Wang. So as we move forward and uh, let's see where we land uh, at the end of this process. And then uh, again, we'll think very carefully about the communication to consumers and we will wanna work with you on what that communication looks like. And um, I, I know with this 5% increase, it may not be fluctuating uh, based on, you know, sort of the, some of the more traditional characteristics. Um, and uh, I guess we'll be thinking about whether there are any other options for consumers here, but even if in this circumstance, um, it, that isn't a, a, an approach, we still wanna make sure that people really clearly understand when this applies to them and um, you know, how, how it will fold out you know, moving, uh, in, moving forward. So uh, as with Allianz, we'll wanna talk to you about what your communication to consumers is. Yes, Janine, uh, we will work with the administration to put forward the best uh, communication to our policyholders. That's great. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, are there any members of the public um, who would like to be heard with respect to these two specific rate increases? So we're not here today to talk generically about long-term care or any other companies, but if you have any comments that you would like to make specifically about the Allianz Life Insurance Company proposed increases or the Berkshire Life Insurance Company proposed increase, um, please let us know via the chat function. Okay, I am not seeing anything. Ms. Forno, do you see anybody? I do not. Okay. I do not see anything at this time. Thank you. Um, having said that, uh, let me just poll the members of my team to see if there are any uh, additional comments that you would like to make today. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, so thank you to Mr. Lasko and to Mr. Wang. I appreciate your presentation today. Obviously, this is one part of a multi-dimensional process, um, much of which occurs uh, with the actuaries and your actuaries going back and forth over numbers and information and documentation. Uh, and so what we will do is close out today's hearing. I do wanna let folks know that uh, if you wish to make comments, you can still do so in writing. Again, if you go to the MIA's homepage, you will see a tab that says consumers on the, on the landing page. If you click on that, and then go to the long-term care link, you will be able to input or upload any of uh, any comments that you would like to make. Um, we will be receiving those comments through next Tuesday, August 23rd. So please try to get them in by that time if you have any comments. And with that, uh, that will bring today's hearing to a close. I wanna thank everybody and um, have a great rest of your day. <laughs>